Welcome to Fictionary. I'm your host, Deetra, and I'm so glad that you're here and that you are you. If this is your first time joining me, Fictionary is a place for you to sit back, relax, and escape reality for a few moments. Today, I'm drinking my tried and true oat milk latte with cinnamon and a sprinkle of brown sugar. I'm also jamming on this pumpkin scone that I got from Whole Foods. So the brand is called Mason Dixon. This is not a paid advertisement, guys, but they're amazing. Um, And they make and sell frozen biscuits, cinnamon rolls, and scones or scones, depending on where you are from in England. Um, Anyway, don't get any more canned biscuits, y'all. Um... These things are amazing. I got the pumpkin scones and it's life changing. It's a game changer. Um, They use simple, clean ingredients. And according to their website and the packaging, they say they make them from scratch. And as a recent convert, I can attest to the fact that it definitely seems like they do. They are so good. Like, You buy them, they're frozen, you pop them out, put them on a tray, bake them, and then you can trick your friends and family into thinking that you are the world's best baker. I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember um, those Rice Krispies treats ads when the mom would go and she'd make Rice Krispies treats and then she would like come out with like flour all over her face and look like she did like all this hard work. You can pull that and then just be like, yeah, I made these biscuits from scratch just for you guys. I made these scones from scratch just for you. Enjoy. And then everybody's going to be like, oh my God, you are so amazing. You are the best hostess. These are delicious because they are. It's so good. They're dangerous. So get some if you haven't already. Mason Dixon biscuits, uh, cinnamon rolls, or scones. And again, I'm not getting paid for this. I just really like them. Um, So enough of my dangerously delicious treat. Um, It's spooky season, you guys. It is upon us. And in honor of spooky season, I like to try and watch scary movies and shows during the entire month of October to, you know, kind of stay in the mood and, you know, just like have that vibe. Um, So there's one show that I tend to watch around this time every single year. Um, It starts in September. And I don't know why, but as soon as September hits also known as fall, at least in my book, um, I start watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I sometimes start from the beginning. Depending on where I left off the last time I watched, I start there. Um, But I'm always watching reruns of Buffy and her Scooby gang um, every fall. And I'm watching it now. And I feel like it's pretty apt because it's spooky season and, you know, vampires, demons, all kinds of like oogie boogies. Erg, arg, er. <laughs> But anyways, um, I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's one of my favorite shows. And watching it now as an adult, I can say I definitely have a different perspective. I've seen like all these memes where they're like, you know, you're uh, getting older when you watch these teen shows and you relate more with the parents than you do with the teenagers. And I can say I have gotten to that point where I watch now and I'm like, oh, hell no, she didn't just talk to her mom like that. Oh, no, they didn't. Who do they think they are? Like, you have no job. You have no money. You don't contribute anything to this household. And you have the audacity to speak to your parents like that. So, yeah, you know, I'm like, hashtag team, get off your lawn, get off my lawn, as my best friend always says. Um, But one thing that I've noticed uh, that I never noticed before (laughs) is that Giles was freaking hot. I don't know how I didn't notice this. I never saw it when I was younger. He just looked like an old dude to me. But he was definitely an attractive gentleman. And plus, he had an English accent. I mean, come on, guys. I'm like, (laughs) I've been taken aback by how attractive I find Giles this uh, viewing of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I don't know what that says about me. Um, But Giles was hot. Um, But beyond the hotness of Giles and, you know, the nostalgia of watching Buffy, um, I still really appreciate how feminist the show is. I mean, obviously, you know, there's issues. There's issues in anything. um, And you can pick it apart. But I grew up, you know, with girl power as a mantra. And I feel like 
Buffy fits that bill. You know, again, there are some issues like the way that Xander and some of the other guys on the show talk about women. But I mean, when you think about it, it's kind of realistic. Um, There are men that speak that way about women and have those kind of views. And I think Xander's kind of like that every man character or every guy character. And we do get to see him have some growth and transformation and the kind of the effects of his his attitudes and like um, his his successes or failures. And um, so, I mean, I appreciate it. It wasn't like they glorified that stuff. Um, and. I don't know like Buffy was badass guys like she was like kicking kicking vamp butt on a regular she was slaying demons saving the world and uh one thing that stands out to me more now than ever before is that even though Buffy was the chosen one she really she wasn't able to do it on her own right she needed her friends. She needed her watcher. She needed her her mom. She needed her family. She needed her sister, right? All of these people uh, fighting on her side. And, you know, it doesn't matter how great you are. You still need people on your side. And this is a truth of life. Like, we're not designed to be alone. Um, life is difficult. And, you know, while we may not be fighting, like, actual monsters and stuff like that, we're facing struggles and it's hard to go through those things by yourself. So it's important to have a good support system around you and people that, you know, are going to be ride or die for you and, you know, stand by you even when you're wrong. Cause you know, Buffy wasn't always right. And I think that's uh, something that as again, as an adult, which I put that in quotation marks, um, when we think about characters and the arc of a story of a character's storyline, a lot of times like we want our heroes to be like these perfect people. But one thing that I found that's like been especially true in more recent years and stories and movies and books and things like that is that people are not afraid to show the true um intricacy of what it is to be a human and what it is to be a a hero a quote-unquote hero you know everyone is flawed like nobody is perfect and you know we look at characters like superman and superman was like if you talk to my best friend he was pretty much perfect like he never killed like he wasn't like if you compared him against batman right like batman killed people superman never did um which you guys can come at me if I'm wrong, but I mean, like the idea of like these perfect uh, specimens, and nobody is, and there's there's depth to people, and there are these areas of darkness within all of us, and I think that we need to learn how to be more accepting of that in others. I think we have like these unrealistic expectations where we expect people to always be perfect and nobody is perfect um and allowing that but then also allowing for the growth to happen and I think that's one of the reasons why I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer is because you see like characters that are flawed they're human right but in spite of their flaws in spite of you know their shortcomings they still are able to rise to the occasion and be strong and do good and um save the world. Like, look at the Willow story arc. I love her story because, you know, she starts out and she's kind of like this naive little innocent nerdy girl and she goes through all of these changes. She gets her heart broken. She falls in love. She comes out. Like, she becomes like this powerful Wicca. Um, She goes into the dark side again. Like, she's not perfect. and But she still is a part of changing and you know saving the world and doing good things on a regular basis and you know it's not saying as an excuse like okay well we all have darkness in us so we just expect people to do bad things no but it's saying that that is a possibility there is 
the possibility for people to not be perfect to sometimes fall short but the question is is how do they come back from it you know how do you rise up from those uh, times when you fall down or where you fall short of the person that you want to be um and I think that's important you know we have to have a little grace for one another um I mean obviously there are some things that you just can't wash off or say okay well that's okay but you know sometimes there are instances where we can be have more grace towards one another and more forgiveness and just be able to move forward but anyways I went on a whole tangent I was just supposed to be talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer but it got me feeling philosophical um I think personally um in my life there's situations where there's people that I really love and care about and I I I love them I really do deeply love them and I can see faults that they have and things that they've done that you know I find distasteful or um I really dislike or are hurtful but at the end of the day I know that's not all that there is to that person and so I'm I'm rooting for them. I'm there for them. I, I want to see them become the person that they they are are called to be, meant to be, um, because they don't have to live in that mistake or those mistakes. Um, I believe they have the ability to move past them. Um, and, you know, it's not our place to be that for every person. You know, it's okay to walk away in some situations, but in some situations, maybe you are called to be that ride or die. Maybe you are called to be there for that person and support them and help them to grow and develop, especially if they're willing to do that. Like, I don't know. I'm just not a big fan of giving up on people or <laughs> situations. So, anywho, back to Buffy. <laughs> I know, I know, guys. Sorry. Uh, But Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So a thing that I really love about Buffy and that I find has been able to, like, stand the test of time is the special effects makeup. Um, If you look at the special effects makeup on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, even today, the work on the show stands up. I like the one that I would say was like kind of terrible was the wolf um, for Seth Seth Green, um, his werewolf costume. I think that for me was probably like one of the most disappointing character looks. It was also one of the earlier ones, but I don't know. It was just terrible. Like it was kind of cheesy, but I mean, maybe they were going for that. Um, the actual face makeup for the wolf was was good, but it was like that full body costume just looked insane. He looked like, I don't know, I don't know, a wildebeest. What does a wildebeest demon look like? I don't know. I'm going to have to Google it after I'm done. Uh, but yeah, the makeup was awesome. And like the vampires, like the consistency of like the transformation of the vampires. Like I would love to get someone to do my makeup uh, and be a vampire from Buffy the Vampire Slayer because that would be dope. Um, so any of you special effects makeup artists out there that are looking for, you know, a little test subject, I volunteer as tribute. You can uh, make me over if you turn me into a vampire from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's all. <laughs> but anyway, today, guys, we are going to be doing a special reading. Um, we're going to be reading chapter two decisions of the Kindle Vela serialized story, The Traveler's Journey. And if you haven't listened to part one, you can check out episode eight of Fictionary, Hulu's Hulu Calls and Stuff. Um, I interviewed the author, Brittany Gaving, and we read chapter one. Um, you can also go and check it out on Kindle Vela. Just look for The Traveler's Journey by the author Brittany Gaving. Also, be on the lookout because her first book, The Unseen Age of Deliverance, drops November 16th. And it's available for pre-order now on Amazon. So you definitely want to check it out. Um, I love her writing. I was able to be a reader of uh, The Unseen Age of Deliverance um, and... 
it's good guys like this universe that she's created is really in depth and beautiful and it's a a great story so i encourage you guys to check it out support an up-and-coming author um Again, you can get it on Amazon right now, um, and it drops November 16th. So don't wait. What you waiting for? Just go pre-order now, okay? Um, but anyway, we're going to get into chapter two, Decisions uh, of the Traveler's Journey. The Traveler's Journey, episode two, Decisions. Papa cradled me in his arms as I shook violently. He held me closer to his chest, squeezing me tight, but the shaking wouldn't stop. The fear of facing the reality of my vision keeps me from opening my eyes. I can hear Alma's voice showing away my audience, their questions going unanswered. Here, give her this, I heard Alma say to Papa. It will help calm her down. Papa put a small vial to my lips, trying to encourage me to drink. After a few tries, I give in. Calmness washes over me, and I drifted into a dreamless sleep. When I awake this time, it is barely dawn. Out the window, I could see the tiniest sliver of the sun on the horizon. I was in Amma's wagon. Her beautifully woven gold and purple blankets hugged me, shielding me from the cold, crisp air. My muscles ached as I climbed out of the bed to see what was going on. I hear voices coming from the front of the wagon, which were thick with frustration and fear. This is my fault. I must tell them what I saw. The old door creaked as I pushed it open, alerting anyone close enough to hear that I was awake. Papa paced the floor frantically as Mama and Alma sat at the little table in the corner of the room. Before I could fully step out of the room, Papa was at my side to help me in. It's okay, Pop. I'm fine. No, you're not. In all my years of being a traveler, I have never seen someone react that way in their first vision. You're not fine. Oh, hush up, you big fool. She's already terrified enough without you making it worse, Ama interrupted. Come sit and tell us what you saw. I promise it will be fine. I took a seat next to Ama. She took my hand and caressed it gently. The softness and warmth of her hands brought comfort to my soul, as if everything would be fine, as she said. But it was false hope. I told them what I saw. The horrible bees. Decay. Death. And hollowed eyes filled with darkness, just before everyone turned to ash. The look of despair in their eyes said it all. Are you sure they were bees? Mama asked. Yes, Mama, I'm sure. What does it mean? The pounding of Papa's large feet shook the wagon, making its old wood whine under stress. In visions, bees are a sign of sickness and death. But as you know with visions, nothing is certain. We can live our lives as normal as possible and nothing could happen. Or we could fight against what fate has decided to show us and doom could consume us all. It's not up to us. I can't just live normally after seeing what I've seen. There has to be something I can do. Wasn't there a story of a seer in the mountains? The one on Violet Mountain? My mind desperately searching for a solution. The story says she sees all outcomes. She can tell me how to change my vision. Lenora, that's just a story. And one that's older than I am, no less. If any of it were true, that seer would be dead by now. I will not lose you because you're out trying to find someone who doesn't exist. How could you say that, Papa? These stories are the stories of our people. If there is no truth behind them, why would we continue to tell them for generations? If there is a chance I can stop this, shouldn't I take it? I can't go out there and tell everyone that they are going to die. How could anyone live peacefully after that? 
You will do no such thing. Alma interrupted. We have no reason to tell anyone out there what you saw. It would destroy them. What you saw is not set in stone. But even if it was, what good would it do to tell them if you can't change it? Let them live happy, happy lives. And if doom comes, then so be it. But if not, we will have saved them the pain and suffering of knowing of this terrible vision. Let this be our burden to bear and ours only. You're right, Papa agreed. This doesn't leave this room. We will carry this burden alone until it comes to pass. Or if you have a vision of a different future. Agreed? Agreed, Mama and Amma said in unison. Papa stared me down waiting for me to agree. A defeated sigh escaped my lips and I forced the words from my mouth. Agreed. I'm sorry, but I can't. My mind was made up. Come nightfall, I will set out to find Messia and save my people. Papa spoke to our people on my behalf, explaining that I had a terrible reaction to the midnight Silea essence, but all was well. He told them that my dream predicted years of great travel and fortune to come. He was a good liar. The crowd believed him and everyone cheered and celebrated. I couldn't bring myself to face them, so I watched from my window as the day slowly passed me by. The happiness was bittersweet as I knew it was all a lie. Desperate to keep things the way they've always been, I began to pack. In my mind, I repeated a mental list of all I would need for my trip. Food, water, maps, coin, medicine, mochi, and essence. I threw my travel garments in my satchel and headed out in search of the rest of the items. No one seemed to notice me amid all the celebration. Seeing everyone so happy had me convinced that Papa had done the right thing. For now, at least. Now it's my turn to make sure it stays this way. The rest of the day went on as usual. Everyone laughed and ate. The elders told stories at sunset as children did their best to act them out. Now was the perfect time to gather the rest of my things. The coin and maps were easy. Mama and Papa were enjoying the stories, so their wagon was left unguarded. I snuck in quickly and snatched a coin pouch and counted its contents to myself. Four gold, twenty silvers, and thirty coppers. The map of our most recent travel sat out as if it had been waiting for me. When I stepped out, I saw the sun had just dipped below the horizon, so I knew I had to hurry. I shoved them in my pack and headed to Alma's wagon next. She had the map of the seers. Her wagon was dark and void of her warm presence, but I knew that wouldn't last long. Fumbling through drawers and cabinets, turned up nothing but vials of unknown concoctions and trinkets from all Amma's travels. None of it was anything I could use. The last cabinet stood out with colorfully stained glass doors and was high above all the rest. That must be it. Pulling up a chair, I climbed to reach its handles. It opened with a creak and rolls of maps tumbled out onto the floor. Laughter and voices seemed to grow closer as everyone started to turn in for the night. Time's up. Frantically, I rummaged through the horde of maps when one that red mountain seer caught my eye. I stuffed it in my satchel quickly and put the rest of them back in the cabinet as neatly as I could. I peeked out the window and saw Alma making her way to her wagon. She was slower these days, so I had time. I tore through more cabinets looking for medicine, but came up empty. Where could they be? Flashbacks of me as a child seeing Alma put medicine in the drawer under her bed entered my mind. I dashed for the drawer, but the creaking of the door told me I was out of time. I reached in and grabbed the first vials that filled my hand, shoving them in my satchel with the rest of my things. Oh, hello, dear. 
You startled me. What are you doing in here alone? I, um, I... It's okay, dear. Calm yourself. I know what you're after. My heart froze in my chest. You do? Of course. You want the essence. It's okay. I know you must feel horrible, but inducing the vision again won't change its outcome. It's best you leave it alone for now. I relaxed and released a breath I didn't know I was holding. I just thought it might help. Ama embraced me warmly and kissed my cheek. The only thing that will help is time. She smiled a comforting smile. I am about to have my evening tea. Would you like to join me? We can talk more if you like. No, that's okay. I'm going to turn in as well. Okay, dear. I'll see you in the morning. Guilt stabbed my heart. I love you, Amma, I said, giving her a quick hug and left before the tears burning my eyes could escape. I ran into Mama and Papa headed to their wagon. I kissed them and said goodnight as I would any other night and headed to my wagon to wait. I surveyed the items in my satchel, eliminating items from my list. Eagerly, I examined the vials I managed to grab. There are five vials, two of which were antidote solutions. The other two were for pain. And the last, a bottle of Salia essence. Luck was on my side. I took everything neatly away in my pack, taking care not to break the vials. The sun had completely set and the settlement was quiet, save for the birds and creatures that scurried around at night. It was time to leave. There were three things left on my list to gather on my way out. Moochie, my horse, softly neighed as I approached. She greeted me by nuzzling her nose against my hair. You have to be quiet, okay, girl? I have a few more things to grab, then we can head out. I dressed her in her traveling saddle, filling it and my water skin with food and water from our traveling storage. Are you ready, girl? She shook her large head no. I couldn't help but laugh. Are we going to do this now? She shook her head again. Fine. I caved, knowing precisely what she wanted, fishing out a bright red apple from the barrel. Moochie stomped with excitement when she saw the juicy apple in my hand. Is this what you want? Without hesitation, she gobbled it up off the palm of my hand, juice flying as she crunched into the ripe apple flesh. I took a moment to say goodbye to my people silently. I'll be back soon, and I will save you all from the horrible fate I predicted. Moochie nuzzles my hair again, letting me know she's ready, and my heart is heavy. I mount her and ride off into the night. Time seemed to stop on this never-ending road to Tamworth, my first stop. This road was much lonelier without my family by my side. The last time we traveled this road, it was a happy time filled with laughter and the warmth of knowing home lay ahead. Now, if I don't hurry, it might be the last place my family ever travels. The sky was still black and speckled with shimmering stars, and it gave no hint at how much longer I had until morning. But I needed to rest soon, and I could feel Mochi was tiring. In the distance, laughter and shouting echoed out into the night air, telling me we weren't far off from town. Hold on just a little longer, girl. We're almost there. Riding over our last hill, the gates of Tamworth came into view. Hordes of people entering and leaving the city swallowed us up as we rode through the gates. Traveling the streets outside town were eerily quiet, but here it was as if no one slept. The streets were alive with merchants and traders, dancers spinning to the beat of drums as people clapped along. Dismounting Muchi would bring less attention to us, so we walked side by side with our heads down. 
the crowd seemed to be heading in one direction. Ahead was a strip of taverns where the sound of lousy lute playing, drunken singing, and laughter echoed into the night air. I didn't recognize the song, but everyone around me seemed to love it. The singer ended with a belch loud enough for me to hear out here, and the crowd burst into laughter. I was close enough to see the entrance to the largest inn in tavern. The rundown sign read the Sapphire Lagoon. Inside, around the side of the inn was an empty stable ahead for horses. Moochie didn't need much convincing to get her to go in. The bucket of oats in the corner was waiting just for her. I'll be back soon, I whispered to her as I secured her reins. Inside, the tavern was much larger than it looked from the outside. People were seated above on the balcony level and below at what seemed like at least 50 tables. Every table was full and everyone had a drink in hand. A large stage stood to the far right waiting for its next entertainer. Hello, love. I've never seen your face in here before. A large man with jet black hair and tattoos covering both his arms called from behind the bar, waving me over. What can I do for ya? He asked with a polite smile. I need a boat. I was hoping someone might be able to tell me where I can find one. I'm headed to Violet Mountain, I replied hopefully. Violet Mountain? That's one I haven't heard in years. What's a young lady like you trying to get to Violet Mountain alone for? Crossing the Black Sea is no easy feat, even with the crew. It's imperative that I get there as soon as possible. I'm looking to leave tonight. Whoa, slow down now. Even if you had a boat and left right now, you'd never make it. Strange things lurk these waters at night. Okay. Thank you anyway. I said, unable to hide the defeat in my voice as I turned to leave. I'll have to find someone else to help. I'll tell you what, he called. I have a small boat and I can take you for ten coppers. But you'll have to wait until morning. How does that sound? Of course. First thing in the morning. Okay. You have a deal. I usually do my fishing early before dawn. I can have you to the next island before tomorrow evening. Leaving in the morning would be risky. Someone may notice I've gone and headed this way, but something told me that finding someone else at this time of night wouldn't be easy. Since you'll be staying until morning, I can set you up with the room in our inn. The streets are rough at night, especially for young women. You remind me my little sister, God rest her soul. If someone had been looking out for her, maybe she would be here today. He smiled a little smile, trying to hide the sadness. What's your name and where are you from? My name's Lenora, and my family and I are travelers, so home is wherever my family goes. A traveler? You might want to keep that quiet in this town. Many people aren't very fond of travelers here. Thieves and liars, they call you. Which I think is just ignorance, but in my inn and tavern, anyone is welcome. So you have nothing to worry about for me and mine. My name's Kenneth, but my friends call me Ken. If you need anything, just let me know. I have to go serve these drunkards before they wreck my place. His smile turned stern instantly as he went to shout at a man dancing on his tables. I took a seat, a single table away from the crowd, and watched as everyone enjoyed their drinks. Sometimes a bit too much as people spilled, splashing others in the group as they moved and danced and rocked to the music. Ken moved swiftly in and out of the hordes of people, calling everyone by name. And in kind of a strange way, it reminded me of home. When he saw me, he waved and headed my way. There you are. Sorry I haven't been back to check on ya. It's crazy in here. 
My wife wanted to make sure I got this to you. It isn't much, but it'll keep your stomach full. He placed a bowl of stew in front of me with a small loaf of bread. The smell filled my nose and my stomach instantly began to grumble. Go ahead, eat up. You don't want it to get cold, he said as he patted my shoulder before returning to his robustest customers. The first spoonful left my tongue in shock. The delicious stew ran down my throat, warming every inch of me with each bite I took. Consumed by the flavors of my stew, I hardly noticed a pair of eyes watching me as I ate. When our eyes met, he laughed and returned his attention to tuning his guitar. What's so funny? I asked the strange young man. Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. It's just you looked like you were enjoying that stew. He pointed to my mouth. You got a bit on your face. I wiped at my face with my napkin, my cheeks burning with embarrassment. Thank you. No problem, he said, unable to hide his smile. I returned my focus to my food, but my eyes couldn't help but drift back to him. I watched as he tuned and polished his guitar so intimately as if no one else existed. His instrument seemed to be better taken care of than him as it glistened like new against his well-worn traveling clothes. His hair was dark with wild waves that fell into his eyes as he moved, and his brown, sun-kissed skin revealed he wasn't a stranger to long hours on the road. Is he a traveler like me? The crowd got quieter as the last performer finished. Looks like I'm up he said, as he stood with his instrument and a confident smile. His icy blue eyes met mine for a moment before he headed to the stage, and my eyes, my cheeks burned yet again. Ken's voice boomed throughout the tavern. You all are in for a real treat. I've saved the best act for last, so shut up and let the man sing. The crowd erupted in laughter then quieted down to barely a whisper as the young man made his way on stage. His confidence commanded his audience's attention as their eyes were focused only on him, waiting eagerly for him to play. He looked just a couple of years older than me, but his eyes, even with their childlike sparkle, said he had seen many things. He sat on the stool and played his first chord, Then his fingers danced over the strings, not hitting one sour note. The crowd stayed silent and hypnotized by his playing, and then he opened his mouth to sing. His voice, powerful and smooth, is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Travel home, my lady, was the song. I knew it well. My papa would sing it to mama all the time but I've never heard it like this before. It was as if his voice had been made for the song. When he finally finished, the crowd was quiet for a moment and then burst into a roaring cheer. He played two more songs, leaving the audience more engaged with each verse until he brought his performance to a close. Everyone except two men at the bar cheered as he took his bow. They sat back silent with evil intent in their drunken eyes. My name's Liam, and it was a pleasure to play for you tonight. He took another bow and climbed down from the stage. Sorry everyone, it's closing time, but if you liked what you saw tonight, you could leave a gift at the bar for your favourite performer as you clear your tabs for the night. Everyone began to clear out as they left their tips at the bar. Among all the commotion, I spied Liam gathering his things quickly and flying out the door. Moments later, the men at the bar followed him. This is not your concern, I thought, trying to convince myself. But something in me knew this wasn't right. Instinct took over and I ran out after them. Hopefully, they didn't make it too far. I didn't see anyone out front, but I heard two voices from around the corner. A thick, broken tree branch was kicked off to the side of the inn. It looked sturdy, sturdy, so I picked it up just in case. I followed the voices. 
You little bastard. How dare you show your face round here after we told you never to come back, one of the two men said. Tamworth is a free town. I'll go where I please. It's not my fault you feel threatened by my presence. Tell me, does your lady ask for me often? Liam teased, angering the man, pinning him to the wall. I'm going to kill you, the man yelled as he grabbed Liam by the neck. The other man that was with him backed away. I didn't come out here for this, Jim. You said we'd only rough him up. I'm no murderer. He turned and ran from the alley, not even noticing me as I ran by, as he ran by. I could hear Liam begin to struggle for air as the man gripped tighter around his neck. My mind panicked, but my body was sure. I ran straight for them, my weapon in hand, swinging as hard as my muscles would allow, aiming for his head. The sound of cracking bone echoed throughout the alley on impact and a warm liquid splattered on my face. The man choking Liam dropped to the ground, twitching until finally going still. Frozen, I couldn't take my eyes from the man on the ground with blood running from his skull. Oh shit, I I think you killed him, Liam said through strained vocal cords. I still couldn't speak or move. Did I kill a man? Liam ran to the inn and reappeared with Ken. He approached me slowly. It's okay. He spoke in a calm voice as he pulled the tree limb from my clutched hands and dropped it to the ground. Everything is going to be fine. I'm going to help you. Ken reassured me as he did his best to wipe my face clean of blood. I could hear his words, but somehow my mind couldn't comprehend them. My mind was filled with the sound of cracking bones and the sight of the lifeless man lying at my feet. What is to happen to me now? I'm a murderer. The end. Oh snap, things escalated. Okay guys, so I'm really invested in the traveler's journey. I can't wait to read chapter three. Um, We shall see if um, this gaming Uh, the author of this awesome story will allow us to have a read of chapter three maybe next month Um, but hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, (laughs) my accents were too crazy it's 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 a little bit difficult trying to maintain the accents um through the whole story so hopefully i did okay um and didn't take you guys too far outside of the world and um yeah this story is getting really good oh my goodness I can't believe it. And hello, Liam. Hey, who doesn't like a boy that plays guitar (laughs) and can sing? Ow, ow, ow. (laughs) But um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. We'll be back next week um, with some more spooky stuff to talk about and some spooky original stories by myself. And also... Get ready because we're going to be launching Miss Deacher Reads uh, podcast and YouTube for children, and that will be coming at the end of this month. So, you know, get ready. Uh, release date will be on October 30th, Saturday, October 30th. So, get ready. Yay. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, keep on reading. Thank you.